and they were selling these glass head sewing pins and they're really so they're really sturdy <laughs> I'll be picking them up <laughs> at the end of this recording. <laughs>
So I hit all three of those. I hit two of them more than once. Um, and uh, yeah. And then I also stress bought while I was there online, which also came a whole bunch. So while I was gone. Visiting family is stressful. You can have amazing family, but I just think once you become a grown ass human being, returning back to your family of origin, and I will say this, I will say that that's very cultural. I will say if you're like white middle class raised in the United States, I won't even say West because I think in like some European countries, it's very different. Um, like I was talking to a friend of ours one night who lives in Australia and is white. And they were saying that there you kind of live with your parents through college or uni as they <laughs> call it. But, um, I think it's a very like white middle-class American cultural thing. And I think, you know, we're all socialized. And so I think it can be hard. It's hard for me like to go back and yeah. Yeah. I think the other part that makes it hard, at least um, with my family is that my family um, isn't very accepting of mental illness. Like they'll be like, oh, okay. Yeah. You can have this mental illness, but once you start showing, symptoms or behaviors that correlate to that mental illness because you're being an imposition on someone else and so like it's more of the um for me at least it was more of the like i have to work really really hard to like, i have to keep it together i can't i have to keep it together yeah. yeah 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 and like and it was really interesting for me um, going home too because like I've been married for almost 10 years like I'm used to my routine here and like what level of like dis distress tolerance I need to do here on a daily basis and going home like it was going home to my parents house was exhausting because it was a completely like different level of just dis daily distress tolerance I'm just like oh man like I suddenly don't feel as skillful as I used to. <laughs> yeah. So that's okay. But um, my husband and I budgeted before um, I left for Texas for me to have a spending yarn budget so I could stress by because that would be um, healthier for me than some of the other past uh, coping mechanisms that I had used, especially around my family. So. So, so I was pretty skillful with that, um, but I spent more than I would have liked to, but that's okay. So all of that to say, I bought a lot of yarn, so buckle up folks, here we go. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's see. <laughs> we'll start with the stuff from the yarn store first and then we can move on to my online purchases. Okay. All right, this is from Sweet Tea Knits. This is um, their Dreamer Series 1 on their matcha sock yarn base. Um, I got this from um, the Yarnivore, uh, Yarnivore um, what's it called, yarn store down there. It was really okay. cute. Um, and it's blue and white, which I guess is the colors that I've been like really drawn to <laughs> using lately. <laughs> Um, which I think is pretty funny. Uh, let's see. What is that base? I mean, you said the name of it, but what is it? Oh, I'm sorry. It's 75% um, superwash merino, 25% nylon. And it's so soft. It's so soft. I love merino. I do too. All right. Um, in true Annika fashion, I, of course, bought bright <laughs> rainbow yarn because... <laughs> It wouldn't be a yarn purchase if I didn't. This is the Queensland Collection Perth. Um, it's an 80% superwash wool and 20% nylon. And then this one is called King's Canyon. And it's like a marled rainbow. And it's so much fun. I love that. Is it? Okay, it's fingering weight? Uh, yeah, it's sock yarn. Uh, pretty much everything. I don't think I didn't buy anything that wasn't sock weight. Did you just get one of those? Yeah, I just got one of these. Surprisingly enough, like the ball looks really small, but this has, where was it? 
This has 400. Ah! You froze. Okay. Oh no. I know. It's fine. I'm just going to text my entire family <laughs> and tell everybody to get off. Get off the internet. That's funny. Because normally we have a good connection. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah, you do. What, Linnea? Yes, give me just a sec. This is real life, people. This is how it's going to be. This is the not normal <laughs> this is Hold just on. this is just one of those where we're like well this is what it's gonna be that's cool okay oh my leg is asleep oops there we go okay thanks all right Okay, so repeat how many yards are in that? You said it looks like a small thing, but how many yards are in it? That's the whole thing I didn't hear. 437. Because you know what I was thinking when I saw it? Hmm. If you had gotten three, <laughs> you could hold them double and do a shift. Ooh, that would be super cool. But it's okay, you have one and it's a lovely yarn and there'll be tons of things you could do with it. Yes, and I'm making myself socks with these, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. Not 100% sure, but pretty sure they're gonna be my socks. Um, all right, so the next two yarns are ones that my children picked out at the, at, um, excuse me, at the yarn store down there. Uh, both are by Crafting My Chaos and they're both sock yarns. This one is called Trick or treat party micro stripe. Um, my son picked it out for socks for him. Um, once my kids figured out that I can knit socks, they're like, uh, where's our pairs? So So that's gonna be like, how will that knit up? Will it be like one black stripe, one rainbow, or whatever those colors are, stripe, one black, one? Um, I'm expecting it to be similar to the neon socks that I just knit. Okay. Um, they looked pretty similar in okay. their original form so I'm assuming it'll be something like that pattern wise but I don't know because I've never used this yarn before so yeah this is 75% superwash merino 25% nylon it's lovely. it's lovely are there reds and blues in there or is it the greens yellows orange uh green it's neon green yellow and orange and then black yes and then my daughter picked out their purple party micro stripe, um, which has way more colors in it. This has the pink and the red and the blue and the yellow and the green. Like it's, it's super cool. So it's cool. Yeah. So this is also 75% superwash merino and 25% nylon. And how many yards in each of those? Uh, 462. So you're going to get way more than a pair of socks for each of them out of that. Are you gonna do multiple pairs for them or are you just gonna do like use the leftovers for other things? I might use the leftovers for other things or I might make it so the kids and I have matching socks because I think that'd be pretty cool too. Yes, all right, let's see. Um, let's see, that is all ordered stuff. So, oh, okay, there we go. All right. This is Manos del Uruguay uh, Alegria in the Locura Fido colorway. And it's also a sack yarn. Um, all the colors. All the colors. And the fun part too is that uh, this is Manos del Uruguay um, Alegria. I don't remember the colorway that this was because I bought this like, I is bought the yarn. Alegria or Alegria? Um, Alegria. Okay. Um, I bought this yarn like almost 10 years ago, so I don't remember what colorway this is. Um, but it matches and I'm really happy. <laughs> so, yes, okay. this is 75% merino, 25% polyamide. So, it's nice. Lots of good, like, lush colors in that one. Okay. Let's see how. Hold on. Oh, okay. There, you're back. 
you froze, but it was okay. I was talking while you froze and it kind of worked because I was talking about the yarn while you were holding up the yarn is when it froze. So that works. All right. Fantastic. All right. This one um, is Plymouth Reserve Rescue Fingering. It is 70% superwash merino, 10% cashmere, and 20% nylon. And this was a clearance buy. I was really excited. That so. orange is everything. Yeah, it's it's the funny part is that oh, it's so, green. Oh. I know it's the funny part is that it's showing up really bright here, but this is really more like a rust color, like a deep rust in person. So I don't know. But it's really pretty. It's a lot more muted than it looks in the picture, but that's okay. So yes. And this one's colorway is island time. Okay. <laughs> I guess. Okay. I am um, one of the yarnsters that we went to there had um wrapped their own minis. Okay. Um yeah, and so I bought um quite a few minis. Um so this one is Kyla's Lab, um, which is a local to San Antonio um, comp or uh, dyer. Uh, this one is called Confetti Cake. It's kind of hard to see, but it's white oh, and has that's cute. speckles. That does, that's well named. Yeah, isn't it? I thought so. Um, and this one is 75% superwash merino and 25% nylon. So there's the ant. Um, I got a Crafting My Chaos Mini. Um, this one is called Lollipop Land. It's wow. on the same sock base as the other two Crafting My Chaos, but like... Is that, var is that just a variegated or will it self-stripe? You know, I really don't know. Um, my guess is that it's just variegated. Um, the stripes look too, the stripes look too short. To actually fully stripe. So I'm gonna guess just a variegated. Um, oh, I did buy a full hank of Kobasi um, by Haiku Yarns. It's cotton, bamboo, and silk. Um, and it has nylon in it too. Um, it's supposed to be like their hypoallergenic um, sock yarn okay. that I love. Um, I crocheted a shawl out of this stuff and it's amazing and it holds up so great. Um, and this has 220 yards in it. And this one is color 817. It reminds me of cotton candy. Yeah, it kind of does. Like I different like colors of cotton candy, which isn't a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Linnea saw it and went, oh, it's mermaid colors. And I'm like, it is. It, it is mermaid really is. colors. <laughs> so, all right. Let's see. I have more minis because we're not done yet. Um, this one is Jitterbug Yarns um, Popsicle on their sock base, Ooh. and that's all I know about it because this is one of the ones that um, the yarn store hand made into minis. So okay. there's that one. And then this one is Jitterbug in the um, Autumn Leaves colorway. Ooh. It's not showing up, but there's... Um, olive green in this too. Oh, I can see a little bit hints of it. It looks yeah. kind of brownish. Is it brown and olive? Um, there is some brown, like the dark, the dark parts that look black in the picture are actually brown, like a chocolate brown. Super autumny, which is really nice. Um, instead of it looking more like um, a man's sweater from the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> it really is super autumny. Um, let's see. This one is Happy Feet 100. This is color 15 on their sock base. That's really lavender-y pretty. Yeah, it is. It's super pretty. I thought it, like, it reminded me of a raincoat almost. Like, I have some gray yarn from uh, Periwinkle Sheep. I thought would mix really, really well yeah, with that. that would look good. Yeah. Nice. All right. This is Euphoria Knits. Um, this is their Stardust Mini. Ooh, uh, it's called Flight, and it has sparkles. Which is are you going to use that for socks, or are you going to put it in something else? Um, 
I don't know. I like honestly bought this yarn with all intentions of all of this becoming socks. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we'll see what happens. I'm not a hundred percent sure. You know I might save it for the knit along. Ooh, or you could do that stripes. Ooh. Imagine if you had a sparkle, non-sparkle stripe. That'd be super cool. I don't know what, but yeah. I'd love it. That'd be amazing. All right. And then the last mini that I got is um, Smushy with Cashmere. So this is a dreaming color yarn. Um, and this one is uh, called February. That's pretty. Yeah. I like the reds with the teals. And is there olive green in that one too? Um, it's more of like a light, like leaf green, not olivey. Okay. But yeah. Nice. All right. So that is it for the yarn that I bought in person. Now we can move into uh, the yarn that I bought online and the other things that I acquired online. Um, so to start off, um, we, we, in our little friend group chat, Farrah and I were discussing Rainbow Yarns with Sultan, our, uh, one of our other friends, and I got an email saying that Knit Picks was having um, a sale on their Hawthorne fingering weight, which is like a stock yarn on the rainbow ones. And so um, Sultan, Fair and I have a hard time saying no to rainbow sock yarn. And so this one is um, their rainbow mini stripe. And like- I cannot wait to see how that knits up. I know, me too. And it's so bright. I'm so happy. So it's really cool. The swatch that they had online was was like one row around was a stripe. So I'm really, really hoping that. I think they can sometimes look so different than they can. Yeah. 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 And then uh, the other one that I got was uh, the of the Hawthorne base, which is um, 80 wash or 80% superwash Highland wool and 20% polyamide. And this one is called their white rainbow. And so this one should micro stripe, which is pretty cool. Oh, nice. I'm so happy. I like how that one has fuchsia in it too, almost in a way. Yeah, yeah. Like kind black, of the black hawthorn I've got, I think does too though. So I like that. Sweet. And then um, after watching Farrah knit with bleachy sock yarn, I got a couple of those too. Um, the ones that I got were Playhouse. Love. I know, I do too. And then um, the other one that I got. Orange and gray go so well together. Yeah, and since they threw in like that mustard and that mint green, like it's just perfect. I'm so happy. And then the other one that I got is called Coffee Break. Nice. Yeah, and this one was pretty muted, nice. but I'm pretty sure that Eric would uh, wear socks out of this because like this color here is showing up as like a light like purple or pink, but it really is more of like a light beigey color in person. Yeah, and it shows up kind of like dusty rose, a very pale dusty rose. Maybe. Yeah, and it's definitely like I mean, it is a pinky brown, but it's a really, it's more brown than pink yeah. in person. So I don't know. Um, but I think it's, I think it is um, mild enough that I can get Eric to wear these socks. So we'll see. All right. Let's see. What else did I get? Oh, okay. So I got um, Knitted Wits uh, Death Valley National Park yarn. Like, it's so pretty. <laughs> Um, the moment that I saw that they were doing uh, Death Valley National Park, I'm like, I have to buy that yarn. My family, um, I grew up in California. My family um, owned a property in Death Valley, and uh, or my great grandparents did. And every year we'd go out there for the Hoot Nanny, and we'd go out to go camping and just hang out like every November. And so Death Valley holds a lot of really good memories for me growing up. And I'm like, I need this yarn. So. It's beautiful, it's gorgeous. It's 80% superwash merino, 20% nylon, and the colors are just so good. And it smells really good too. I just, yeah. Does the it smell, smell sheepy or like dye? Smells sheepy. Nice. Yeah, smells sheepy and I love it. Okay, 
Let's see what else did I get. I got um I got Quarry Fibers. I jumped on that bandwagon too. Thanks to Fair and Sultan. This one is the potions class. Um colorway. Oh, many stripes. It's yeah, it's a 20 stripe. I'm so excited. So I'm really excited to see how it works up. Um, this is 75% superwash merino, 25% nylon. And it's a 20 striper, so the socks might be sisters, or we'll see. I don't know, but I'm really excited. All right, let's see what else they get. I got a lot of stuff. Okay, um, I scored one of the Luna Pearls um, Starlight ones. I am so excited <laughs> because I've been stocking her sale for several weeks now and I'm just never quick enough that I actually got one so I'm really excited and like this is it shows up like kind of baby this is the thing that Sultan knit socks out of yeah this is the one that Sultan knit socks out of and like it looks so different when you knit it up it does because it shows up like way more pinky um but like when you knit it up you definitely get way more gradation of colors which is yeah. really really cool like, it really it is like a so subtle and I feel like his photos it was so much brighter yes I agree I yeah. agree all right um next up I got some stuff from um excuse me Lizzie plus sixes uh d stash that she did a bit ago um and none of these have labels on it so I really don't know what they are um but I know that there's sock weight and that there's I love that merino and I'm pretty sure these ones are merino cashmere and nylon if I remember correctly but I got two of these because they were just so pretty and it's cool because like there's a bunch of neon in it and like it shows up really differently on both skeins but so. I think because those have so many colors with a white mm -hmm. they would you that it makes them so versatile like you could use those in a fade Oh and yeah, in different fade patterns because it will fade well with so many different yarns because of all the colors in it. Yeah, like so to be the top of a fade with all the white, you know. Oh, it'd be so pretty. Yeah. All right, so this is another one that I got because okay. rainbow neon sock yarn. Like, how can I say no? So, and it's really cool because this one has speckles in it too. And it's so pretty. Hold that up with the other two. Cool. Like, look. Oh, here we go. If you did like one, two, you know, line them up to that, totally. There's a fade right there. Yeah. I might. Whoop. You could do a find your fade shawl. I haven't done one of those yet. It's on my list. I might do that without the bigger one. All right. Oh, and then I also bought a sock set from her too. Um, this has speckles in it. It's like a light pink. The main base is like a light pink and then it has darker colored speckles in it which is really cool so and then it has a coordinating mini which is really neat so all right and then it's still going folks um <laughs> um i ordered from spunware over the rainbow um this is one of their sock blanks this one's called dark side of the moon bow and it is superwash merino and nylon so and it, pretty yeah so it's really cool i've seen people socks knit up with this and like they're absolutely gorgeous so i'm really really excited and this one smells like dye and it just makes me really happy too so i like the smell of dye sometimes I like it. I like it when, like, depending on what they use for their mordant for the acid dyes, because, like, it smells kind of sheepy, but, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, kind of musky at the same time, and I love it. All right. Um, I also got a yarn or a sock blank from Lola Bean Yarn Company. Um, this one is their Apple Orchard colorway on the string bean base, which is a 75% super wash merino and 25% nylon and like it's just so nice absolutely beautiful like I'm so excited to make socks out of these so and it's so soft mm, so soft plus I think the nice thing about sock blanks is you can actually see what they'll feel like knit up yeah different you know 
Yes. Yeah. I also like blanks too, because like you get an idea of like what the pattern's gonna look like. Oh, there's a hair in my eye. Uh, of what the pattern's gonna look like when it's knitted yeah. up, at least more so. So that's pretty cool. All right. Um, I also got some yarn from Onyx Fiber Arts, and this was um this is the summer colorway on her sock yarn, and it's seventy five percent. Superwash Merino, 25% nylon. That um, can go in the fade. It might. It might. Like, it would <laughs> match. I'm not the boss of your yard. I'm just like, you know what would work. This, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, like, I'm honestly kind of indebted to her yarn because her yarn was the first yarn that ever made Eric go, oh, I'd wear that. Like, <laughs> which is amazing because... Um, it was her burst colorway, which is what this mini is of. Um, Eric saw, I bought a, a big skein of it and, uh, Eric was like, oh, I'd wear that. And it's amazing because literally all Eric wears is gray and black and yeah, I, so the fact that <laughs> he saw that, I was like, I want that. I was like, done, check. I will make that next. So <laughs> pretty cool. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So um, I did buy another mini of her, mm. the peppery colorway. Um, it's also on the sock base. And I just thought it was so pretty and I thought, and I loved the speckles, the gray and white speckles. I thought would be such a good contrast for like sock or uh, for heels and toes. I was going to say that'd be amazing heels and toes. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I'm like, that'd be perfect. Because as we have seen from my haul so far, I bought a lot of bright yarn. <laughs> All right. Um, one of, so this is the last yarn that I bought. Um, I still have some other items too, but this is from Whatnot. Yay, um, Kathy. My friend Kathy. Um, this is her four ply fingering. And I don't know what colorway this is because there's no name on it, but it was really pretty and purpley and blue. And uh, I bought this for um, for our knit along that is coming up. So I thought this would be super fun for it. Yeah, yeah, that's really yeah. pretty. Yeah. All right, we're almost done. We're getting there. Um, and then we have to do mine. <laughs> yeah, but then I get to take a break from talking. So that's oh, okay. okay. Um, Kathy also sent me like the most amazing presents along with my order. She sent me my favorite Australian chocolate, um, which I have been slowly piecing out to myself. Um, my aunt and uncle and cousin lived in Australia for six years and they would send us care packages with Australian chocolate. And oh man, that dairy milk chocolate, I got hooked. <laughs> and, and the Kit Kat flavors out there too, also, also got hooked. Um, so she sent me a bunch of that and like, totally feel indebted to her for that forever because it was such a nice surprise. Um, but she also sent me these really, she sent me a sweater marker. It's really cute. It has puffins on the back. And then she also um, sent me this really cute little sheep progress keeper and a flower progress keeper. Um, and then, hold on. And then um, she also sent me um, several little fabric handmade with love tags, which are like absolutely darling. Um, oh, speaking of the progress keepers, I ordered some of those from her. Um, I ordered, okay, hold on. Let's see if I can figure out how to open this. <gasps> Yay. Okay, so her progress keepers came in this cute little plastic tin, which is like, great because otherwise I'm pretty sure I would lose them because <laughs> so I got I love this one this radish one just like really spoke to me she has she had I don't know if she still has it on her website but a vegetable line and I'm like I don't care which one you give me I love all of them and she sent me the radish and it's pretty great um I got oops I'll just actually turn around so you can see sorry I got a watermelon one um, and then I also got, um, 
this really cute gnome one for one of my friends who collects gnome things. But these are just like incredible. So yes, there's that. And then um, the last thing that I got from uh, from Kathy is this pin that says sip sip knit <laughs> focus and uh since my since my username's tea fueled living and like i always have a mug of tea with me like i was like oh this qualifies as a need right yeah okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um i also ordered um some notions from firefly notes and I can show you some of them, but I can't show you all of them because some of them are for my fiber share partner. And by the time that this airs, they will have not received it. And I want it to be a surprise. Um, so first off of Firefly Notes, I got their Go Fish stitch markers. Um, and if you can see, let's see if I can get it to focus. Oh, please focus. Um, they're, I'll just take it out. It's not coming up. That's okay. Hold on a sec. Uh, they're fish shaped stitch markers. Let's see if I can get this to focus. There we go. They're fish shaped stitch. I'm dropping I them. It. <laughs> <laughs> it was there. Uh, they're fish shaped stitch markers and they're super, super cute. Yeah. And then um, the cool part about it that I didn't realize when I ordered it um, because I am learning that I am so great at reading through everything before. I buy it. Um, <laughs> fish stitch markers, but uh, yeah, I was like fish shaped stitch markers, but check. Um, it also came with this really cute, oops, little rowboat oh. address keeper in the pack too. Ah, I just dropped it. <laughs> All right, and then the other one that I bought for myself is this really cute snail stitch marker progress keeper because I collect snail things so. And snails are my favorite animal. So, yes. All right. And then, oh, only a couple more things. Okay. So I also um, bought some pins from Crip Fem um, Crafts. I got her I Heart Libraries pin. <laughs> <laughs> I got a pronoun pin, and it says they them in it. And I liked it because it's just really simple. Yeah, and I like the flower design around it too. I do too. I do too. I also like that the uh, um, font is really easy to read. Yeah. Um, and then I also got their grab bag, uh, pin grab bag. And so one of them says never pill shame on it, which I am all for because pill shaming is like terrible. Don't do it, people. Don't and then. <laughs> And then um, one of the other ones says to feminist as fuck. And I'm honestly just impressed with the lips. Like the lip drawing is like really impressive to me. So yes, I think that's it. Awesome. Yeah, that's it. I'm done. Woo! <laughs> okay, let's get into it. So First, I'll do a non-yarn thing. I don't know if I should go by days or what. I don't know. Oh my god, I just found more. Okay, show. Do it. Okay. Do um, it. Okay. Um, but these ones are from you. So I, I feel like I should definitely show these. Okay. So, <laughs> so Farah sent me the tea fuel diving bag. Um, and I love it because it's beautiful and it stands up thanks to the gussets at the bottom and it has a zipper on the top and it currently holds my whole entire work or my whole entire whip, which is really exciting, um, which is currently uh, two cakes and it holds my Notion bag too on top of it, which is really cool. And the Notion bag that I'm talking about is this amazing they them one that she made me. <laughs> It's on rainbow fabric <laughs> and it has the background of the bag that I originally bought from her and I love it. And like, look at this arrow fabric on the inside. Okay. Just... Here's the cool thing about that arrow fabric and I forgot to tell you. I was at a Salvation Army by the Pound mm -hmm. and they just had this like bandana size swatch of fabric. That's and awesome. 
I can get this and it's totally upcycled and I can make a project bag out of it or a notions pouch. Yeah. So this notions pouch is amazing and I already have stuff in it. Uh, Farrah also got me this awesome pin that says it's too peoply outside. <laughs> I think it's so great. So great because there, there have been several times where we've been having conversations and this phrase has come up and yes. I'm really happy. So, And I got one for myself of those too. And when I got it, I was like, I have to get Annika one. <laughs> and like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that's what you do. Yes. And I love it. Thank you. So, okay. Yeah. Um, day one, I went to a class. So I ended up in going to two classes. Day one, I went to a class that Patty Lyons, my fairy knit mother taught called bind offs, cat, cast ons and bind offs. So I thought, you know, like, she probably won't really go over long tail. It'll probably be more advanced ones, mm -hmm. but I was, or different style ones, which there were, but she started with long tail. And this is what I'm going to say. All she did was re-solidify her place as like my fairy knit mother because she started with long tail and within 10 minutes, my mind was totally blown and I learned things about long tail cast on that I have not known and I've been knitting for like over a decade. And I was just like, <laughs> and now, and it was amazing. It was totally incredible, loved it. It was the first thing I did, um, yeah. So then I went to go meet someone. So I had gotten a press pass for the market and stuff like that. And I met with somebody from XRX events who told the stitches events and we kind of walked around the market together. And then I got one thing cause I was meeting our friend Sultan in real life the next day. And so I didn't want to do a ton of shopping, but I saw the Sun Valley fibers booth, which um, is in Mount Horeb, Wisconsin which is where my partner Matthew grew up. Did you know that? I didn't, no. And they raised their sheep and um, I have gotten a skein or two of their yarn years and years ago um, from like a local yarn shop in Wisconsin. Well, I saw this and was like, oh my gosh. Hold on, I have to move all the other things out of the way. <laughs> So I got a sweater's worth, which is six skeins of this, which is actually, I don't, you can see it there. It's a Grello because there's gold and yellow specks. And this is their 100% Merino Superwash worsted weight. There's 220 yards per skein. Um, and I saw it and I was like, this is going to be my weekender sweater. And it will be my weekender sweater. It's going to be um, so pretty. I am so excited and I love it. So yeah, I love Grello and they gave me a tape measure, which I will put in a backup notions pouch. So then I went back to my hotel cause by then I was like done, like completely exhausted, done. And so then I went back to my hotel the next day, <laughs> I, signed up there was one so I had been considering doing a drop spindle class before I went but I didn't sign up but I asked and they had one spot left so it was taught by the Sheba guys who I didn't know about at all they're from Seattle oh yeah I didn't know about them at all um and it was taught by them and so for that class you paid for the class and then you paid like a $20 materials fee to them at the class. And so for that, I got a drop spindle and this has some stuff I'm spinning on it. And you got, this is my first hand spun that I applied. It's amazing. Uh, I love it. And so it was basically, here's the rest of that ready pink that I spun last night and then here's the rest of the off-white 
I have left. Sweet. Um, it was really fun. I wasn't stressed. I mean, I, they made it really fun. I appreciate that. I wasn't super stressed at all. I was just like, okay. Like this was Friday that cause Thursday, Wednesday, I drove down Thursday. I did the Patty Lyons class Friday. I did the spinning class and I did mm -hmm. half the market with Sultan Friday. So then I met Sultan who's fun. Noma Diddy co on Instagram and that was awesome. So now I'll just show everything. So jealous. I know we used to. <laughs> so now I'll share everything else I got over the next two days. Okay. One non knitting thing I got is there is a shop called Brooklyn Haberdashery and they were selling these glass head sewing pins and they're really So they're really sturdy. <laughs> I'll be picking them up <laughs> at the end of this recording. Um, and they're glass and I love them because some of my other cheaper pins I've gotten are really bendy and flimsy. And so I wanted, I've been looking at these online. So I thought, well, I'll just get them here and don't drop the tin people if you get them. I'm gonna be picking those up for a bit, I think, but that's okay. All right, so that is the thing I got. You need a super strong magnet. You need like a super strong magnet and then you can just like hold the magnet over and pick up all the pins. I know, I have a tomato pin cushion, but I didn't mm -hmm. um, put them in there because I wanted to show them for the podcast. And then I was gonna switch them out after we recorded, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, oh. one thing I've said before on the podcast is I knit for, pro I buy for projects, and being at Stitches proved for me how true that is. Like, just grabbing, ooh, we're frozen, I think. I'm going to wait till Annika comes back until I see them moving again. Hi. Hi, that was weird. You were like talking and then it just shut down. Weird. Okay, it's fine. Um, I, there's now stuff of me talking to myself that I can cut out or not, but I've decided our bloopers clip is definitely going to be my pin container exploding. <laughs> <Just show. going. laughs> All over the place. That will be how this gets open. Okay, so, um, oh, so I said I like buying for projects. And this proved to me that that's true. Like not having a project that I'm looking for stresses me out when I'm shopping. I don't know why, but it does. It just makes me anxious. So I like having a thing I'm shopping for. So to that end, um, I want to knit and I own the pattern. I'm pretty, yeah, I, I bought it already. The, it's called Birds and Ships by Caitlin Hunter. Boyland Knit Works, and it's a cowl that's really pretty and has like cable lace up the front and a tassel. And I got this for it. So I wanted a yarn. This is Two Guys Yarn Company um, in their Riverweed color. And this base is called Sheep It, and it's fingering weight. It is 80% uh, Superwash BFL blue face blister and 20% nylon. And I got this because I wanted to get BFL because it's a little bit, it has more body and less drape than like merino, cashmere, a lot of things, silk obviously. And because this is a cowl, I didn't want it to just hang. Cause sometimes I don't like that. Cause then you can't see any of the detail in the cowl. I wanted it to stand up a little bit. It doesn't have to be a brick, but a little bit. So I got a BFL. It's so pretty. Okay. I got, this is the one random skein I got that I don't know what I'm going to do with. <laughs> um, because I just loved the colors and this is by destination yarn. Um, it's their postcard base. It's fingering weight, 25% superwash merino, 
25% nylon, 463 yards. This colorway is called Ball Run. Such a good name for it. I know. Isn't it lovely? It's so pretty and it's speckly and it's gorgeous. Yeah. And it's all, so I love fall autumn colors and there's a little blue in it, which I like too. Yeah. What are you? Yeah. So pretty. Yeah. Hey babe, yeah. we're recording right now. Hi Eric. Hi. <laughs> the world says hi. Well, probably not the world. The world doesn't watch, but all of the people who watch our podcast say hi. Oh. He just got home from his 12 hour shift. So <laughs> I'll hurry. Okay. Then I'm gonna knit some mittens, some color work mittens. And the pattern is in it's a Brooklyn tweed pattern. And I think it's called, isn't it called 24th and 8th or something? something like that it was some street name thing. and it will be in the show notes Annika will put it in the show notes because they're awesome and are doing show notes and it amazes me and the show notes will be up earlier than Thursday this week I promise which is awesome so I got more Sun Valley fibers for the color work mittens so pretty um this is their 100% merino superwash fingering weight so get this 400 yards of this regular price not even show price 20 we, we bucks looked it up. we looked it up 20 bucks a skein for 100 percent merino superwash 400 yards so this is the color shadow and this is mulberry so pretty together and i cannot wait to do these mittens it will be lovely okay the rest of the stuff I got is fiber, and some of it is a gift. Some of it is not. Oh, I did get a bottle of soak, because I didn't have any. And this is the yuzu soak flavor, which I really liked that. And fig were my favorites. I wish we had smell of vision capabilities. I know. It's all so good. Um, OK. <laughs> pins everywhere. <laughs> Be very careful. Please don't stab yourself. I won't. Okay, this is fiber that I bought. It's so pretty. This is Blue Moon Fiber Arts 100% BFL. This is eight ounces. And the color is called Dark Side of the Blue Moon. <laughs> And I love it. So I'm going to wait to spin this until I get better at spinning because it just is really special. And yeah. <laughs> but that's eight ounces, which should make a good amount of yarn, I'm guessing. It, it really does. It really does. And once you get more confident with spinning too, so it's not all art yarn, like yeah. it goes way farther which is really nice too so um the rest of the fiber i'm about to show you is gifted by sultan who um had these extras <laughs> and gave them to me and one of them he died for me so this is the one he died and i love it so pretty I can't wait to see how like the white spins up, you know? So that's white because it looks, it looks like a yellow in the picture. Oh, oh, I see. Very pretty. I think this is yellow and muscle. Oh, okay. And then there's both. But cool. it's nice. And <laughs> he wasn't sure which fiber this is. I think it's just a wool blend. But I mean, it's really crimpy, so it'll be bouncy. And it maybe has like, I don't know, like a one to two inch staple length, maybe. I don't know, maybe a little more, more than an inch for sure. So cool. We'll see what it does. Then <laughs> the yellow. 
Our mm. board gave her a yellow, which is fun. I love it. <laughs> Pink and orange, <laughs> which is fun. <laughs> bear which is fun um and the thing to know is he gave me a wheel that's what i haven't shown because i have to assemble it and do a little bit a few things on it and then i'll show you when it's all done but basically he went to he he has multiples and so he gave me this one which he got it's a louette s10 and he got it from a garage sale for $10, which is insane. Not insane, I'm not, I'm working on not using the word insane, which is incredible <laughs> because I just think the people had no idea what they had. Um, yeah. I paid $100 for my Lewitt S10 because um, I had the same wheel and like, that was after bartering with the person and getting it down because the wheel was broken and missing like a drive band and the um, peg connecting the pedal to the wheel was gone. And I'm just like. <laughs> it was missing a drive band, but Sultan got the parts that it was missing. And I then. Um... The only thing I'm going to do to it, it needs to be assembled, but Sultan painted it black glitter, which is, I totally appreciate and is lovely. It's just not my aesthetic. So my brother said he would take it down to the wood for me um, and then I'll assemble it and start using. So I'm just going to really focus on this for the drop spindling and then hopefully have the wheel relatively soon. And Thanks do some online lessons and learn to spin. And that's what I got at Stitches. Yay! And we should announce too, Annika and I are now on yarn diets. Yeah. Because yeah. I want to get all the things I have. And I'm at the point too where um, I don't have I don't know where I'm going to put the yarn that I bought. It's literally just been sitting in a box on my couch next to where I knit, but um, like I need to use up some of it or some of the stuff that I already have so I can actually put stuff away because I know it's bothering my husband and it's bothering me. So yeah. So that's that. Okay. So now yeah. here's where I will officially insert the video for the mental health moment and put the slide. Yay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, everybody, this is my guest. Um, I know her in real life. <laughs> um, I'll let her introduce herself with all the things <laughs> she might want to say. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you, Farah. First of all, I mean, I just in in clarity, we've been friends for a while. Yeah. Um, so it's it's fortuitous that you have this. And congratulations! What a great idea! Yay! Um, I have other thoughts about this that I'll talk to you about later. Um, but secondarily, that there's just an intersection here that's really interesting. And so, thanks for asking me because I'm really happy and and honestly honored to be a part of this. Um, my name is Melissa Fletcher, um, she, her, hers, and I have worked in disability services for, I always say, since about the age of eight years old, actually. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit more, and then I'll talk about what I do, and then I'll talk about kind of exciting things that are really happening in disability, and also just what I think students especially need to know when either they're entering into disability and higher education, or just in general, like what are the things that um, are either helpful or can be uh, sort of pitfalls that people don't always know about until they get onto the scene. And so, um, yeah, so when I was eight years old, about eight-ish, my mom's best friend had a daughter that was deaf. And the experience that I had growing up with her was really um, showed me a lot about just sort of the inequality of the educational environment. 
when you have a person who does not require accommodations like I do, and then you have a student who is deaf that has to come into that space, and they have to do things like arrange for sign language interpreters or assistive aids. Um, and I always had the experience of Karen telling me, well, you know, I fell, in, I fell asleep in front of the interpreter, and the interpreter kind of woke me up, or... <laughs> go to school today and therefore like that cost some money you know for my for the school district like you know that wasn't great that I wasn't there um and I always just thought well I don't you know it's different for me as as a person that doesn't require that accommodation like you can fall asleep in class and who kind of who cares if I don't come right yeah I mean yeah um but that inequality just of access was really clear to me at a really early age and We've been talking about it forever, but still the idea of universal design and educational spaces is still something that we think about, that we sort of toss around, that we really fight with, that we argue with, that we think about, that we, um, but there's ways to go, but I, I, I'm heartened by the fact that even in the last couple of years, I think that there has been a sea change that is starting to happen and a critical mass that's starting to happen and that is really largely to do um, with students who identify as being either neurodiverse or mental health or mental illness, um, because the accommodations that, that they often require are pretty unique in some ways and can be the ones that are a little harder to navigate or negotiate at times. And I, so, think, I think, too, not to interrupt, but I, I, I think <laughs> having gone to a university before when I wasn't I, I needed accommodations then. I just didn't realize I needed accommodations and yeah. wasn't getting help. But right. it's but just seeing how issues around mental health and neurodivergence were handled then versus now, it's very different. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. And um, so I think we still, you know, it's it's unlike other spaces in that we still often are honoring models that are from the 1970s or, or even years before that come and you yes. sit in a class for the standard amount of time and then sit in your space and then there's a PowerPoint and then the professor talks about a thing and then you get some notes and then you get this time test. Um, but I think that is starting to change. And part of the reason that that's starting to change and it's the reason that things have always changed in the disability environment is because, you know, people are getting kind of tired of it. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing more things where students are being very open about that or saying, hey, we have some, we have rights here that accommodations are not just nice things that happen. But not only do we have some rights, but we really want to see these things change. So, um, so that's been really exciting. And in the field, I've, I've I've been in the field a minute. Um, I've been in disability services directly since about the mid nineties um, at the University of Wisconsin Madison. I really started learning those pieces, and have been involved. Been a director at other universities, and currently a director at a college. Um, and what I'm seeing that's different and that's really exciting is that not only are students taking a lead on it, um, we don't want to give all the responsibility to students, but I'm just starting to see the conversations really happen. Like, here's a great example. Like, what do we do about attendance flexibility? What do we do about extensions of time on things or homework assignments? What if a student really can't make it to class based on a disability piece? Like, where are not only the lines of that, which is always the, you know, always, yeah. always about those things, but secondarily, um, I mean, I think we're just starting to see faculty really sort of understand those pieces too and say, all right, is attendance super important in my class or are there ways around this or are there ways that I can really investigate this differently? Um, so I'm seeing so much more focus on universal design than I've ever seen since the 1990s. Hmm. And, you know, that's due to people having a voice about it. Yeah. But... Um, Historically, disability has always been, it's always been due to a fight. So the stuff that we see now, the ADA, 504 Rehabilitation Act, that all came, it was all organically started from people who went out and protested. It was and, from DAPT. And that basically is what establishes a student's right, like legal right to accommodations, right. what right. you just said, right? For people listening yeah. who are like, oh, what is that? Although, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And so, you know, and there's three kind of models, and I'm sure everybody who has ever had a disability piece knows this, and I'm sure you know this, um, but I think it's still worth saying, and that's, we have kind of three models historically for disability, and one of them is that we look at the um, historical, or we look at a medical approach, right? Like the st student person like has this thing, and we're all trying to run it and kind of fix it. Um, we've got another approach that really is a legal basis for things like what are the rights of the individual with a disability? What are the civil rights for that? And um, we've taken a lot of that model from the good work that others, people who have had civil rights movements, uh, people of color have done, for example. Um, but that still has a basis of where else are the lines, like what's a reasonable accommodation? Um, and that's long been the basis in higher ed. Um, is where, you know, what do we have to do, where are the lines, um, and now that's really shifting to what we want it to become, and that's more of a social model, and a social justice model, which is that disability is not that you are broken, that disability is actually a very natural thing that happens in life, mm -hmm. if you live, all of us are going to have one, mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of the one group that you can become a member of without warning, you can be a person with a disability, um, but also that societally, we don't honor those spaces and we don't honor, we still view disability as being this thing of brokenness and that's starting to shift. So now it's really saying, now we look at disability as how is that inclusive, how is that diverse, and how is that value to, to especially spaces of higher education and society as a whole, like what's the value of this? And that's the first time I've really heard language not the first time, but it's changing to value that language of disability as being inclusivity and diversity. And I think that's things we've been fighting for for a really long time. Part, so, of, part of me wonders if like the resistance to change on these areas. I saw this meme on Instagram that, I don't know, there's a group I follow called an account, the D Disabled Makers, and it's mm -hmm. um, co- moderated by three different people but um i don't know if they posted it or somebody else but just the idea how like capitalism makes it so that all of your worth is based on what you produce yeah yeah or like how am i contributing financially mm -hmm. and what a disadvantage that creates for disabled folks and how and so I wonder if some of that resistance to change like where that resistance I mean I'm sure highly is embedded in capitalism and you know all the things but that might be a whole nother topic but anyway yeah. Yeah, there is something that I think happens in higher ed spaces and I want to also say not all of them and I have to put in the caveat that I also work with some great people that get this yeah and great faculty members who who get this or who are changing it and changing the narrative of this and really are saying, you know, we have to view disability in the same lens as we view every other civil right. And why is this kind of dragging behind? Like, why, why aren't we catching up with that? Um, but that being said, I think in higher ed, too, there's kind of this thing of, well, it was that way for me. So, um, you know, you're going to work hard at your PhD and you're going to put in a hundred hours a week because that's what I had to go through. So there, it, that's, you know, that tier hierarchy of that yeah. hard to get rid of. Um, so there's, um, it's not even necessarily a quote unquote old boys club, but there's just this thought of like our collective pain in doing this. And I think that's starting to shift too because we're not only seeing students with disabilities, but we're seeing, you know, faculty members, we're seeing staff members who also are having that experience and saying, I need accommodation on my job or, gee, I, I need to do this better for me. And so what does that look like? How do I make this, how do I make this better, just more inclusive for me? And there's some relatively easy steps to do some of those things. So, um, it's it's not really rocket science and i think once people start on that path at least with faculty i think that they start to get really like excited and how can i be creative about this um how do i not just do a time test what's the other way that i can really assess knowledge of all of my students so i can meet them where they're at and so, so i know you do like independent consulting stuff too so you work not in just academic settings, but you have had experience going into like all kinds of environments and yeah. talking with people about accessibility. 
Yeah. Um, so here's another thing that's pretty exciting, and and this is I I'm sort of embarrassed to say this, but I sort of always had the had a belief that well, if you go into the world of work, I mean that's going to be harder, right? Like getting accommodations, like they're going to want you at desk nine to five, um, and. I've been out and doing some acts, some consulting pieces, and then also just with my job doing some networking pieces as well um, through other local organizations that I know. And I'm like, oh, but employers are starting. I really get this. Like they understand this. So that whole notion of once you get out into whatever the real world is, that it's going to be <laughs> you know, harder and different for you. I'm seeing that not being true either. Like hmm. employers are getting the pieces that they need to know. Um, and, and creatively so in some really good spaces in some really good ways. And are you seeing that, yeah. is that different based on where people might live? I mean, let's not even go internationally, right? but like right. within the United States even, you know? Yeah, and I think it depends on the company. So one of the things that you had asked me to think about is really like what, what advice do you want to give to students? And it's sort of the going in, advice I would give to students is sort of the going in and the going out piece. So when you're coming into any space, you have some things that are legal rights for you, but you also have spaces and schools that are better at doing that or not better at doing that. And so it's really important to vet the school that you're going into and ask them the hard questions about what kind of accommodations they provide, how do they do that, what is their view on confidentiality. And also are there student support groups, student active groups on campus, because that makes a big difference too, um, because that can really move things forward pretty quickly pretty quickly on a college campus if students are really active and involved and feel like they're cohesive in that effort. And then on the way out, it's the, sort of the same thing as that, to really be looking and, and vetting your em employers for, are, do they do this well? I mean, what's, what's their lens on this? There are places that are great and there are places that aren't. Um, and weirdly, some of the bigger places um, are, are somewhat better at doing this in terms of accommodations. So, that's been a surprise to me as I get out and consult with other people and say, oh, well, you get this, you get flexibility, you get that, you know, a person may really have bad days and not feeling well. And how do we, how do we shift a deadline for somebody? I mean, let's face it, no one's going to get $50 out of their paycheck because they didn't turn in their report on time, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that there's just this view of that we have, um, we have a workforce that is diverse and that includes disability and how do we look at that? One thing I've always loved about my job, always, and I mean this, is that I think that people, students with disabilities, disabled people, whatever, whatever you want to identify yourself as, have this great way of figuring out gaps in our society and in our system. Um, so, I mean, like door actuators, the buttons, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, everybody uses those, and those were first intended for people in wheelchairs. Um, and it's the same is coming true now as we look at more broad scale accommodation pieces that um, we figure out the gaps, we figure out what's not working. They just they, fitters. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they were trendy and like in every store ever, you know? Right, yeah. Right, right. And they work for everybody. So if you're talking about flexibility of attendance on a job, I mean, that kind of works for everybody, right? Yeah. Like, no one wants to just be there this amount of time and exactly every day. So you get better production when you start to look at access pieces. You get better. You get better. Um, and, you know, I don't. I sort of like the fight. I mean, I, I'm I'm not sorry to say that there's sometimes, and maybe that's part of my personality. I don't mind being the fish up the stream, um, but there's just sometimes that it's it's really cool and rewarding also to um, to work with students who are who are doing these incredible kind of changing things, and to be part of that as well. So. Um, yeah, I love that. I love that part of my job. I think that's great. The challenge of it is really interesting. So some of the people who watch the podcast might not consider themselves neurodivergent or have a disability. Right, right. But <laughs> might have, like, a family member, child, sibling, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, friend, best friend. Like, You bet. What's your thing for them? What's, like, you know what I mean? Like, if you had one right. word of advice. Like, I think it's. Yeah, 
I don't know. Just because I think you, I only know from my experience, whereas mm-hmm. I think you've met a broader range of folks. I don't know. What, yeah. I yeah. I'm intrigued. I was just curious about what you would say. <laughs> Well, um, so I think it depends on who you are in that space. So if you're if you're a parent that feels really different, then you might be as a friend, um, lover, partner, supporter. So, um, but I think all of uh, something that's important is is um, and I'll use a, I'll use an individual with a disability first. No matter what you're doing, whether it's accommodations or um, pieces that you need or civil rights or things that you're you're trying to get in a space for yourself that help make whatever you're doing accessible for you. There's also a piece that's sort of your bag that you have to manage. It's the stuff about going to therapy or managing medications or getting support and knowing who your system is and knowing who your team is. Um, And that takes time to manage that piece, but it's also really important. And um, I always remind my students not to forget that part, you know, that it's, it's important to know what your bag is and how to lighten it sometimes when it gets really heavy for you. And I think the same is true with supporters, partners, lovers, uh, siblings, friends, parents, is also that they have some things that they do differently too, and they may carry some weight of pieces of disability that at times could be challenging for them, or that they may just not know um, mm-hmm. how, to, how to deal with a situation that's happening. And this can really come up, especially with mental health pieces. So it's important for them to have a bag too. You know, what are their support systems? What is their team? And to... Um, and to, to understand where the boundaries are. The boundaries are not taking over for somebody else and uh, not being paternalistic in that. But so knowing how to support without taking over, that's yes. a really hard thing to do. Um, but it's it's really important too. Mm-hmm. So, um, and in my work, sometimes what I see is parents that don't know where to stop, that case manager piece. <laughs> <laughs> when their students come to school, it's like, you know, it's really important to allow that person to be an individual too. You're not doing them a ton of favors by micromanaging everything. Yeah, because doing. they'll never learn to navigate systems and accommodations for themselves as adults, like post college, if they can't right. learn now, you know. Right, right, yeah. and this it's the time to learn it. It's also the other thing that I just want to say, and boy, I'm not saying this only for people with disabilities. I'm saying this societally. Like, we have a real problem with failing. <laughs> so, we just be okay. Can we just be okay? Um, so, <laughs> um, and that the other thing I tell my students all the time, I, I actually have a, a poster in my office that's, like, that talks about having a goal where, you know, it says, here's the plan, and then it, the goal is, like, a little person on a bike, and it's got the flag, and it goes, like, straight up, and then there's an arrow, and then uh, then underneath it, there's another picture that says, and, and here's reality, and reality is this up and down curve, you know, but there's also a flag at the end, and the flags are actually the same, but I think that we have to allow ourselves to have paths like that, and have the really down stuff, and have this really stormy times, and to have that be okay too, yeah. you don't be perfect in this process. So the other piece of this, I was kind of talking about being good enough and that we do good. Oh, yeah. And I was not a great person with this. I mean, I was not, you know, like what's my, I, I, anyway, that whole perfectionism thing, right? Um, but in 2011, I, I had my own experience with disability pieces and um, was down for the count. I mean, literally one week where I was out running 10 miles, the next week I was in the hospital and no one knew what was wrong with me. And it took a really long time for them to solve the riddle of what was happening with me. And it was both some orthopedic stuff and some autoimmune stuff. Um, but, you know, I did the whole scope, like 11 specialists, how many MRIs. It just ebb and flow is sometimes good, sometimes not. And I'm holding steady, but um, but there's times I'm not. And so that piece for me is is just great understanding of that too. Like, um, I never, sadly, I never really got that before and just the association or the knowledge of the medical model and kind of going through that. And it really gave me a good perspective and lens about, um, about managing your stuff and also how tricky it can be. Sometimes being a person with a disability is, is a part or not full-time job in itself. This is the thing to navigate and often either by yourself or with people that aren't uh, very supportive, meaning sometimes insurance companies. <laughs> so, 
So how are you supposed to do this? And I was lucky. I had the knowledge base, right? I knew how to speak the language. And I kept saying, like, how do people do this if they don't know what they're talking about in terms of functional limitations or arguing with an insurance company? Or um, how do you just keep up? And so I, I really recognize also that as excited as I get about turning the tables, we've got a ways to go. And we are not good societally at honoring people with disabilities in the space that they are. We're not good at that. So, um, yeah, I yeah, think we we're good when they, I think we're good. There's all, another thing going around on Facebook, like how to be a disabled person and, or it's on Instagram and it's like, you know, do really good and push, you know, like be the person where you're fitting into an abled space. Right. Even right. if it's like, ah, you know, really, so that everybody can like either, that you either need to be fitting perfectly in that abled space and overachieving so that everybody can be like, look how brave you are, look how da da da, or you need to be barely needing them to rescue you. Right, yeah. right. So, um, one of the things I hear from my students is like, I did really good because I hardly used any accommodations this year. You know, that's, that's the measure of, uh, of, you know, how, how good you are as a person with a disability. And I, I try to challenge that thinking with my students that this is, it's, accommodations are not a reflection on you. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's different. Um, and also, yeah, just also just, again, honoring that space of being good and good enough. We're just not great at that still. We've got a ways to go. So I, I don't know what changes that. I mean, I'd, I'd write a book on that and make a million dollars, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we're starting to see the change, and I'm, that's what excites me, is I think we're going to get there more than we have in the past. And so, um, yeah. I don't know. What questions do you have? What things have come up for, for you or your, your viewers, especially? I, d I don't knit, so I can't talk about that. <laughs> well, I mean, I think for me, you know, one thing I've really been reflecting on the past couple weeks is the idea that I think one benefit of sewing, knitting, crocheting is a lot of times you can just follow a pattern. And, you know, a couple weeks ago on the podcast, I didn't have a mental health moment because it was a rough week. And so I said, hey, the mental health moment for this week is that there is no mental health moment. And I just kind of shared, which is like the little segment I do each podcast, this one, you know, and I just kind of shared um, that that's one thing I appreciate about like knitting and sewing and things that have a pattern is this, is that for me to create original content, for my brain requires me to have inspiration. And when I'm depressed, I don't have that. Yeah, sure. But I can follow a pattern. Mm -hmm. And then you still get that positive feedback loop of having created something. Yes. But yes. you don't need mm -hmm. the inspiration to create content, like intellectual content. You know what I mean? Because that's sure. just not there when yeah. I'm in that space, you know? Um, and so like, I've seen that in school academically too. And I appreciate how you shared about, you know, like reasonable accommod, like, what does that look like? What, like flexibility about deadlines, stuff like that. Because, you know, fortunately, since receiving accommodations, all of the professors I've had have been amazing. And I agree too, I really, it resonated with me when you said sometimes it's the bigger places that are better at it. Cause you know, I go to a big 10 university. I mean, the university of Minnesota has like what? 50,000 students, maybe more. I mean, it's a massive university and all of my professors this semester were incredible. And I know it won't always be that way, but it was this past semester. And even my most curmudgeonly old school professor was amazing at that <laughs> and I was kind of afraid to give him my accommodations letter right right I was afraid to email it to him right right and then I did and then he asked to see me after class yeah and then okay. I was a little nervous too because I'm like oh my god what's this and then he was incredible right he was like right. so hey these accommodations like how do you what do you think you need from me like how do you see this and I was like oh well you know, I said, like, I don't know when 
unfortunately, like, I can't predict when I'm going to be depressed. <laughs> like, I wish I could, but <laughs> I can't. Like, I can't predict when a rough week is going to happen. And so if that were to happen, I might just need a little bit of flexibility in, you know, stuff. And he's like, okay, yeah, that's totally doable. And then he was like, what about test taking? Because for my ADHD, I can have extra time. And I just said, you know, actually, I don't think in this class I'll have problems with that. But if I do, what about this? And he was like, oh, yeah, that completely 100% works for me. And I was like, okay. And so, like, that was my most curmudgeonly strict professor. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, and a couple of things happened there. One of them was that he he knew what the expectation was. It was kind of written out on paper. Um, secondly, you were able to explain and define not only – define your need. Um, the other thing I want to say is I always want to make it clear to students that they don't have to disclose the specifics of their disability piece. It's up to them if they want to do that. Yeah. And the disability services office can come in and explain to an instructor who may not know that or may ask things that are inappropriate or may say, I don't want to do this. Yeah. Good disability services offices will come in and do that intervention piece and maybe even do a little explaining on the upfront. Like, this is what the accommodation letter means. This is what the expectation that we have of you. Here's the five things, professor, or here's the five things, student, that we want you to be asking of each other. Like, yeah. here's kind of that you can follow if you don't know what to say. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I didn't, he doesn't know the specifics of why I need those accommodations. Like I said here, like, oh, with my ADHD, but I didn't share them with right. him specifically, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, those, I think that's a, those are good examples and I see certainly more good examples than I do not good examples. And I think that's a thing. I, I you know, I really encourage students who are going to, into college um, even if you're not sure, if you say, I think maybe I have X, Y, and Z, or I've been really struggling with these pieces and it's, it's, I'm not getting out of bed in the morning. I'm skipping, you know, I haven't been to class in two weeks. I'm really having a, a rough time getting assignments in. Even if it's not a stamped certified disability piece, it's still worth going to their office and talking. Any good disability services office will do a couple of things, and one of them is we may not be able to help you immediately right now, or maybe we can, or maybe we can do something temporarily, um, but we want to get you connected to the right people too and make sure that you feel supported in this. We don't want you to be doing this by yourself. Um, so yeah, so there might be counseling we can assist with or referrals or student groups if you don't want to go that way, or what can we just talk about that might reduce some of that, that barrier for yeah. you. I think the other conversation I've been having with other knitters, like people in my, so I started an online virtual stitch group um, wow. and all kinds of folks who watch the podcast and stuff join on. Cause I said, you know, sometimes like I like knitting with people. I don't love leaving my home right now. And so like, this is a way I can have that connection with other people. And we're all really, really liking it so far. But one of the conversations we've had is around language like how yeah. mm -hmm. how using words like crazy or right it's like so embedded in our culture that even i will catch myself saying it and i'll you know now i'll stop and be like oh you know what i mean or mm -hmm. yeah. hearing people be like yeah i just oh if i had to do that i would just kill myself <laughs> and me being like right. Or the idea of I'm being so OCD about that. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. Yeah, that's shifting too. Even here's a here's a great example and something that we're just looking at in our office, and that is we are, um, my office is called Disability Services. So we've been kind of thinking about I'm in in this space. I'm relatively new. Um, so we've been thinking about name change. Like, what do we do? Do we call ourselves an access space? Student accessibility? And there is a thought about what though is wrong with word disability and that you know that people also really want to own that or even I've been saying all night student with disability what about disabled student what about disabled like why so there's a lot of thought about language and how, how that's used right now and that piece about around the word disabled and disability it reminds me of like the word queer right how it was used mm -hmm. as an insult and then kind of taken back you know right and yes. like, there's nothing wrong with this. And I think the same is happening and happens with the word disabled. Right. Yeah. Right. 
yeah, it's coming, it's, it's coming back around, um, in terms of, you know, and still the, the, the meaning of it or the definition of it, people are taking back, um, the, the identity piece of it. Um, so, so I'm glad I'm, I'm, yeah, I get it. I'm glad to see, I'm glad to see that. Or I am not person with bipolar or a person with mental illness or, or some students dislike saying that they have a mental health challenge because they're like, no, I, I don't have a mental health challenge. I, I have a mental illness or I'm bipolar, I'm depressed. I mean, that's that's who I am. Um, and there shouldn't be shame associated with that to to cluster other words around it. Um, and, you know, and I, I don't know. I, I, I'm I still learning. I mean, even I've been in this profession for 20 years and I'm still learning and I'm still changing. So I'm always think I'm going to go student first because that's just the school I come from, but I'm open to change. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, and I also think too, like every person gets to decide for themselves what they want right. to be called. Right. But I get too, like if you're, yeah, it's good for people to have a general <laughs> baseline of, yeah, what, yeah, I get that. Yeah. Yeah, just like we ask for pronouns, I tend to I tend to now ask students too. So what if there's if there's something that you want as part of your identity, or maybe not? You know, maybe you don't. Um, so that's that's I'm glad to see that question come up too. So I think it changes the narrative. So. Do you and, find that a lot of neurodivergent people craft? Do you think? Let me ask you this. I was thinking about this the other day. I'm like, I wonder if there's. Because part of what prompted me to start this podcast is just listening to other knitting and fiber arts podcasts and sure. hearing other people hint at things about being neurodivergent, Interesting. but yes. not flat out saying it. And maybe right. they are, and maybe they aren't. Yeah. But I feel like there's a high percentage of <laughs> yeah. neurodivergent uh folks in the fiber arts community. Yeah, I would, and I don't know, again, I don't know about fiber arts, but what I do know is that I feel lucky um, because the students that I see and that I work with often are students who are really intelligent and really creative and, um, you know, and that, that that gets lost somewhere. It gets, can get lost under the piece in higher ed of getting your assignments in on time and doing this right or, you know, that I'm only getting... so. So I feel really, I can say as a community, I think, yes, definitely. And I think that there's a lot of exceptional skills that, that are there. So it wouldn't surprise me that in the fiber arts community that there are, there are also a percent, a higher, a higher percentage. I don't know. Um, I don't know. It would be interesting for somebody to actually get data on that if there isn't. I should actually check my library's yeah. journal articles and papers and published papers and see if there is anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and one of the, and one of the groups of students too, that I actually really like working with, um, I, well, I can't say that. I, I really like a range of my students. Um, but one thing about students who have ADHD mm -hmm. is that I'm always amazed at the amount of things that they can get out in a short period of time. <laughs> if you're paper focused thing and saying, all right, you know, just Friday night, you're going to do that paper. Like that terrifies me, but that works for you. And you're, that's amazing. <laughs> and that works better for me than having a ton of time. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, you know, and I'm also really learning a lot about students who are on the on spectrum. So I've had some of my best professional moments have really been with working with students with ASD and understanding that that this is a difference in language, actually, that it's it, it's a difference in language and sort of anxiety tolerance. And once I kind of got that, like, oh, I'm just, I'm not speaking the language. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one who doesn't get this. Um, we have a great group on campus that is a group of students with ASD. And this, you'll appreciate this, is that the first meeting that they had, I'm the, I'm the advisor, and the first meeting that they had, they all sat in a circle and didn't look at each other, but they were all knitting or doing <laughs> or knitting, and they were having sort of these conversations. I was like, I don't really know where they're going with this, but I'm, I'm the odd man. I'm the odd person out here. Yeah. Um, I, you know it's a different language. It's a different way of assimilating information. Once I got that, I was like, Oh, okay. yeah. um, awesome. And so that's, that's rapidly becoming some of my favorite students to work with as well. Just, um, yeah. Cause I think it's pretty incredible. So, 
Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you meeting with me. Hold on. Let me click. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to end the recording now. Is there any last thing you want to say? Anything I didn't ask you that you wish I would have? Um, no, I don't. Just thanks again. And yeah. um, <laughs> I, I, if people want to contact me, they can They can contact me individually. Probably email is the best way to do it. I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs> so should I tell if somebody wants to contact you, should they, like, contact me and I can pass your info along so we're not yeah. just putting your info out on the interwebs? I'd probably appreciate that. That would okay. be good. All right. <laughs> okay. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me, honestly. <laughs> I barely answer my phone. I'm so bad with it. So. <laughs> I'll end the recording, but I won't end our call. Okay. Okay, okay good. Bye. Now here's where we're going to come back from the mental health. <laughs> <laughs> and announce. The Nidda Law. Honorable Court, do you want to do the honors? Okay. Do you the name we came up with? Yes. So, okay. so the Nidda Long that is coming, we have aptly named the Cover Your Ass Knit Along. And we are going to be knitting um, a pattern by Elizabeth Zimmerman, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and they can be leggings or long johns. Uh, it's her nether garments pattern. Yes. Uh, and yes. So here's some of the details for folks who know why we chose this and kind of what the parameters are. So it is in her book, um, The Knitter's Almanac. And, and I, there's also a few other places that it can be bought um as well for about the same price if not cheaper um and i'll be putting the links for that in the rivalry group in our rivalry group in the show notes and also in the posts pertaining to our knit along yeah so first off know that this book was published in 1974 so I am going to, which is like before I was born. So I am going to show you the photo from the book without any details, but do not judge based on this photo. Go look at the pattern page, look up Nether Garments by Elizabeth Zimmerman and look at the pattern page at all the amazing loveliness. So here's the thing to know and why we chose this. First off, this is a recipe more than a pattern. And what that means is Elizabeth Zimmerman gives directions for how you make custom leggings or long underwear, knit them to fit your body. So, so it means that it's size inclusive. So everybody will fit this. Everybody will. And because we want it to be inclusive, we're going to make the knit along six months long. So the knit along will officially start October 1st. And it will end on March 31st. Are there 31 days in March? 30 days has September, April, May, and November. Yeah. So it'll end March 31st. <laughs> um, and that will be the end of it. Um, so that gives everybody six months. And here's the other thing to consider. Like, I'm going to do mine in fingering weight. But you don't have to because it's a recipe. You could do sport. You could do worsted. You could do DK. You could you do could bulky even if you wanted to. Go yeah, crazy. If you want bulky long leggings, uh, which I don't know. Well, who knows? Maybe it'd be amazing. Wow me. Like totally <laughs> surprise me. Okay? There will be no judgment over yarn choices either. Absolutely no. none. Yeah. So um, one thing I want to do is list in so the post is going to go up tonight in the Ravelry group so our Ravelry group you can follow it's um under knitting my shit together under groups and Ravelry except don't put the I in the word shit because we didn't want to deal with swear word stuff put the asterisk like it is on YouTube um so do type out knitting my shit together except put an asterisk for the I and shit so you can show your yarn choices there we're going to put a post of suggested yarn choices by dollar amount so that we're going to give options for different um, price points to make it economically inclusive as well. But don't forget, you can upcycle yarn. You can like go find a couple garments you really like from the thrift store, take them apart and use that. Um, this is also a 
stash busting pattern too. Yeah. Like if you have some stuff that you're deep stash that you're like, I don't remember buying this, no idea what I'm gonna use it for. This is a great pattern for it. And go look at the Ravelry project page, which I'll put a link to in our group so you can see examples of some of the projects. It's amazing some of what people have done with this color work ones. This would be a great way to do helical knitting and do micro stripes because they're done in the round. This mm -hmm. is very easy to be modified. So like, you'll notice like, I'm not gonna put the, um, stirrups on. I mean, this was done in 74 when people wore stirrups. Um, <laughs> I am just going to do like ribbing, a, you know, a twisted rib at the bottom of the feet. And I'm actually going to do a turned hem at the top so that I'm going to then make a band to put elastic through. So I'm going to like do stockinette, do a purl round, do like maybe an inch and a quarter of stockinette, do a purl round, do another inch and a quarter of stockinette to make a turn, and then put in a piece of elastic so that I can, you know, so that they stay up. So there are tons, you could put in a drawstring, there are tons of options you could do. Um, if you want to knit a different style of legging, like I know um, Stephen West has a pattern. You're more than welcome to do that and that qualifies for the knit along. However, it's not the official knit along pattern that we're endorsing because it's not size inclusive. Um, if you live in a warm climate area and you want to knit shorts, <laughs> that works or a skirt that would count. The whole point of this was literally to cover your ass. To cover your ass, like crocheters, knitters, like we're literally just looking for something to cover your ass. That's, yep, that's you can crochet it leggings, that's totally, if you want to weave fabric <laughs> and sew leggings, we will I, bow down at your amazingness. Yeah, that's totally fine if you're a weaver. Um, I don't want to do whips allowed. I want everybody to start and cast on on October 1st because we do give you six months, which is plenty of time. So no whips, uh, but everything else is very open in terms of parameters. Um, what else do we need to say? We are getting, we're taking more prize donations if people want their, because it's six months, we're hoping to do regular giveaways. Um, for people participating, you yeah. can use the hashtag on Instagram, hashtag cover your ass, K-A-L. <laughs> um, what else do we need to say? I'm really excited. I'm really excited for this too, I think. Whoop, I'm not going to drop my computer. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know. I'm really excited. I think this will be probably one of the biggest projects I will have ever made. So I'm looking forward to that, so. But if you live in a place that gets cold, having hand knit leggings, wool leggings would be luscious, I think. Did you freeze again, Annika? Boy, the freezing. Either that or there computer restarted. Oh, there you are. Yeah. You froze for uh, a minute. Hi. Okay. It's okay. Hand knit leggings, amazing. Would be amazing yes. in a winter climate. Um, and it snows here and I walk the kids to school. So, or wheel the kids to school, but yeah. So I'm, I'm doing well. mine out of fingering so that I can wear it under pants or wear it under winter skirts and dresses as well. So, go to the project page, go join the group. Um, there's like eight people in our Ravelry group so far. I checked before, we but go join, join our knit along. It's going to be so much fun. You can use the hashtag. Um, we're going to open a thread to start showing what yarn you're thinking of or what you're thinking of doing. Um, I thought about us having Sultan on <laughs> 
to talk about because he's already begun swatching just not a work and you can swatch you cannot cast on but you can swatch i think we'll say right but your swatch cannot be half a leg that you then say <laughs> oh look <laughs> oh look like we'll say up to a six inch by six inch six inch by whatever the circumference six inch tall swatch um because we're going to talk, I was thinking we could talk about different design elements because like he did research because a thing to consider if you're doing leggings is negative ease. Like with socks, if you want them to stay up, you need to factor in negative ease. So yeah. we'll talk about that a little bit. Oh, one last thing. This book, you, we looked it up. Um, you can get it used on Ravelry for, re or on <laughs> Instagram. Amazon. <laughs> on Amazon for really, really inexpensive. Um, like three bucks we found copies for, I think. And there's other places you can get it. Um, Annika's grows again. We'll see how this goes. I should start doing something really funny, like when Annika freezes. I don't know what I could do to entertain you though. We'll figure it out. Internet restarting. Probably their internet restarted again, which is so bizarre. Because we chat online all the time and I swear this does not happen this often. And I'll maybe edit this part out too. Okay. What's awesome is you're on the screen twice right now. I, I can see that. That's so weird. Um, on. Should I try and kick the other you out? The, the please do. One? There's only one me. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. Fine. It's cool. Oh, hold on. Manage participants. Yeah, I don't know which one is the most current. <laughs> okay. Anyway, <laughs> but I mean, you have a really cute expression on your face. Oh, At thank least you. it's not like. Oh, here I found it. I found it. If if I talk, the little microphone next to whoever's doing it goes green. So yeah. if you if you do the one that doesn't have any sound it should kick off oh i see okay maybe i don't know yeah. Let's yep. see. does that work did it work i don't know i wonder if it's the site that we're using that's having problems because but this is what i said like we do this all the time we video chat and it does not no. do this no i don't know what the issue is because when it when i went to get back to it it said that the site didn't exist I was like, uh, we'll the software, but that's okay. We can add chunks out and it's all fine. Okay. Um, so you can get this probably from your library. You can get it used on Amazon for three bucks. I believe the pattern is also in her book, The Opinionated Knitter. Yeah. So there's three of her books that have the pattern in it. Um, and I'll provide links to all of those so you can decide, hey, which one um, works best for you. There are three different price points. Um, and like Ferris said, you can get the book used for about three bucks on Amazon or and brand new for about nine. Yeah, and you can get them on Knit Picks too, I know, or yep. probably on Amazon as well, but also through Knit Picks. So, yeah. So, that's going to be the knit along, the cover your ass knit along. October 1st, six months. Six months. It's yeah. going to be awesome. It is, yeah. I'm really excited. Me too. Okay. That's it. I think that's it for this week. I think so. Yeah. How long have we been doing this? Less than an hour. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. Go us. Woohoo. I know. Okay. But then we still have to add in the other video, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. But our talking point was less than an hour. Yeah. <laughs> that's exciting. <laughs> so, um, hey subscribe and like us on you the youtube 
we are really close to 100 subscribers last time I checked. Yes. Yeah. You should subscribe and like us because then we can do cool stuff. And also, we tried to record a midweek mini um, where we went over the top five, but it didn't work, I discovered. And it deleted because okay. I had stupid internet at the hotel. So this week on Wednesday, we'll do a midweek mini and it will work. And we might even attempt now that we have decent internet to do it live and it will stream live on YouTube and then save. So look for that too. Um, and you will get notified of that if you subscribe to us. Yeah. And I think that's it. Have a good week, everybody. And yeah. look forward to seeing what you're thinking about the knit along and seeing activity. And it's going to be so much fun. It's going to be super fun. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to get to editing and posting and doing all the things. And yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye.